In this video on impact evaluation, we'll be reviewing eight commonly used impact evaluation designs used in the real world situations. This is uh, taken directly from uh, the book by Bomberger, Rue, and Madbury called Real World Evaluations, that was published in 2006. The matrix that you see in front of you illustrates the eight impact evaluation designs. As you can see across the top, the different columns is that first you'll see there is the start of the project and then the project intervention, midterm evaluation, and end of the project. And one thing I want to particularly point out is all these deal with quantitative impact evaluation designs. In the previous uh, impact evaluation video, we discussed issues of having a control group or a comparative group to estimate that net change of the net impact of our project. In the previous video, we discussed the importance of having a control group or a comparative group to estimate net change that occurred in a particular indicator, outcome or result indicator, due to our project. Highlighted in red are the control one, which means a control or comparative group that occurs at the baseline. And then you can see highlighted in red, circled in red, uh, control group two or comparative group two at the end of the project. And that's the red is for the most uh, rigorous type of impact evaluation designs. The black also are for less rigorous designs. And you can see they still have con control or comparative group at the baseline and also at the end line. And then finally, down at the bottom of the matrix, you see the non-experimental designs are the least robust, and you can tell that there are no control or comparative groups used in those impact evaluations. So this matrix illustrates the eight different types of impact evaluation designs. But if you're like me, that matrix is difficult to understand uh, and really to apply in a real project. So what I'd like to do is to provide illustrations of each of those designs. Let's start out with a general project framework in which the graph in front of you shows the baseline study on the left and an inline study at the right, so which represents the overall project time frame. In the most rigorous impact evaluation design, design one and two, uh, before activities are started, a baseline study is conducted. As you can see, two baseline uh, studies are actually done, one among the, those individuals or households that are going to be participants, receive our interventions, and then a control or comparative group. Then once those baseline studies are conducted, the activities occur. Then once the activities are completed or near completion, then the inline or the follow-up study is conducted among, again, both the participants and in the control or the comparative group. The reason design one and two are put together is they both have baseline and follow-up or inline studies. But the design one actually uses in the identification of a comparative group some type of randomization process or another technique called propensity score matching. We'll have a different video on that. The second design tries to identify a comparative group based on some type of uh, matching uh, characteristics or other type of criteria. But the basic point of design one and two, which are the most robust, is that there is baseline and follow-up study, not only among participants, but also a comparative or control group. So let's consider design number three, which is less robust. In design number three, you see the project time frame there. We have the beginning of the project there at the left of the line, the midterm in the middle, and the inline or follow-up study at the right. In design three, we don't start with a baseline study, either of our participants or a control group. Actually, the activities just get started. Then at the midpoint of the project, we conduct a midterm study. And that midterm study involves then one study among the participants who have been active in the project activities or beneficiaries, and then also another one of a comparative or control group. Then the activities are continued to the end of the project, at which time the follow-up or inline study is conducted among both the participants and then the separate comparative or control group. In design four, which is again less robust, this design is particularly for those projects that have phases or stages. That is, the activities are going to be phased in or staged among the participants. The project timeline in front of you shows the baseline study at the left and then the end of the first phase of the activities or the project at the right. 
So in design four, a baseline is conducted, and they're among two groups. The first group are all those individual or households that will be involved or beneficiaries of the initial intervention or activities. And then also a baseline is conducted among all the latter participants. And those are any individual or households that will begin benefiting the project only after the end of the first phase. After conducting the baseline among those two groups, then the activities uh, occur. At the end of the activities, then the follow-up studies conducted for the end of that first phase of the project among the initial participants, those who receive the benefits in that first phase, and then also then those participants that will now begin benefiting in the second phase. Another less robust uh, design for impact evaluation is, again, the time frame in which there's the baseline and an inline or follow-up study. And at the baseline, only one group is actually surveyed and that is the participants of the project. Then the activities are implemented. Then at the end of the activities, uh, follow-up or inline studies conducted among two groups, the participants, and then some comparative or control group. Now let's look at design number six, which is also an impact evaluation design that's less robust or less rigorous. We start out with the usual project framework in which the project begins on the left, and then an inline or follow-up study on the right. In this design, the project, there is not a baseline study conducted. The project activities just get started. Then, at the end of the project, a uh, study is conducted among two groups, the participants and then some type of comparative group. Of the two remaining designs, design seven and eight, these are considered the least robust. Uh, design number seven, we have the typical project framework in front of us, a baseline study and then an inline or follow-up study. And in this design, at the baseline, we just conduct it among those participants, those individual households that are going to benefit from our project. Then the activities or interventions are implemented, and at the end of all our activities, then a baseline or a follow-up study is conducted, but again, only among those people or individuals or households that benefited from our project. The least robust uh, impact evaluation design is design number eight. As you can see, it has the typical project framework. Uh, the project begins and then ends, and we have no baseline study being conducted. All the activities are implemented, and then at the end of the project, a uh, follow-up study is conducted just among the participants. Of these eight impact evaluation designs, which do you think is the most commonly used design by Save the Children to evaluate its projects and programs, or in most NGOs in general. If you answer design number seven, just uh, baseline and inline among participants, then you're correct. It's the most commonly used type of evaluation. But as we learned in video two, it cannot answer the question about net change or impact of a project. So let's review why it's important to have that control or comparative group so that we can estimate the net change that we have produced in our project so that we can understand the overall impact that we have achieved. Using the more rigorous designs that have control or comparative groups it helps us reduce risks. The first risk they reduce is continuing projects that do not have a real or substantial impact. Or in other words, continuing projects that should have been terminated. The second risk they reduce is terminating projects that do have a real or substantial impact that we may not have necessarily measured, and in other words, that we end up terminating good projects uh, that should be continued. The third risk is not knowing how much effect our activities or interventions can actually produce over a particular time, which is essential in, to improving the design and cost effectiveness of the projects. And finally, one of the risks we confront is that if we use a less rigorous impact evaluation design, the results we receive may be incorrect or very inaccurate and don't provide good guidance on whether or not the project should be replicated or scaled up. We're coming up on the 10 minute limitation of this video, so I'll, I've covered the eight designs quickly, but if you want to learn more, I would suggest you get the book Real World Evaluation. Uh, by Baumberger, Jim Rue, and Linda Mabry, and you would be able to read more in detail on each of these designs. In the next video on impact evaluation, we'll look at uh, the issue of estimating cost effectiveness, and we'll look at one particular early childhood development project that did this.